Hello, welcome to this video where we look at using the definition of the derivative to, to be able to calculate the function that is the derivative function. Um, we did it for a cubic in the last example. It was the same cubic we've been using in this series of videos here. So we want to look at be, being able to do it for another function. Uh, we want to make our way to the point of saying that this is a lot of trouble to have to go through. So I think after this example, you'll be convinced that this is a lot of trouble to have to go through. There has to be a shortcut. And in the next series of videos, we look at those shortcuts. OK, so um, 1 over root x, it's a simple function. And we're interested in calculating the definition of the derivative on it. f prime of x is equal to the limit as h goes to 0, f of x plus h minus f of x, all divided by h. OK, so here we go f of x plus h, that means the 1 over the square root of x plus h. Uh, f of x is already here. Take one guy, subtract the other guy. Great. Divide that by h. Find the limit. Here's where the drama happens. Yeah. What we need is to cancel that h from the denominator. So we need to take some action on this numerator. Um, yeah, h. We need an h factor so we can get the h from the denominator to cancel with the h factor from the numerator. Um, there's, there's, there's a couple things going on here. We have two fractions that are uh, one subtracted from the other. So there's that action. And then we actually have a radical involved as well. So let's handle the one issue by um, we can clear out the fractions. Okay. Instead of just worried about putting the two fractions together in the numerator, we can find that common denominator that makes that happen, yeah, but we can multiply through by it, both top and bottom, though. And what that will do, that will kill the fraction from the numerator. And so if I multiply by root x times the root of x plus h, both numerator and denominator, it'll clear out the fraction in the numerator. Imagine taking this guy and distributing it. The root x plus h is canceled. You just get the root x. And then... The other part of the distribution, when you multiply by 1 over root x, the root x is canceled, and you get the, the root of x plus h, but with a minus on it. Down below, just leave them there. You have the h factor, you have the x a root x factor, now you have the root of x plus h factor. They're just all down there, and we're on our way. Our goal is to get an h factor to cancel with that h factor that's in the denominator. So here comes the algebra technique of, after clearing out the fractions, now we want to multiply by the conjugate of the numerator. So we have root of x minus root of x plus h. We're going to multiply by root of x plus root of x plus h, both top and bottom. And this denominator is expanding on us, but don't worry, it's going to work out. After this, we will have our factor of h that we desire in the numerator. It's like having a plus b times a minus b, the difference of squares. You'll have um, the middle terms cancel out. There will be no radical terms in the numerator. Okay, you can even just disregard multiplying the O and I from FOIA and just do root X times root X gives you X. Root X plus H times root X plus H gives you X plus H, but you got to be careful. It's a negative times a positive, so it's, it's, it's the opposite. It's negative, the quantity of X plus H. As far as the denominator goes, just keep collecting those guys. Don't worry. Why? Because the X's here cancel nicely. Be careful, the negative is also on the H. And we've accomplished our goal. What was our goal? To get an h factor from the numerator. Why was that our goal? So that we can cancel with that h factor from the denominator. We have it. So we take what's left. Careful, that's a negative 1 in the numerator. And we plug in h equals 0. So we have a root x plus a root x in, that, in the parentheses in the denominator. And then a, a, a root x times a root x outside of there. Root x and root x give you x. Root x plus root x gives you 2 root x. So x and 2. So 2x two root x. And you can write that as x to the 3 halves power. You did it. You calculated the derivative, but wow, was that a mess. When there's something better out there, there's the power rule that we can use on this. We just have to wait to the next video to introduce it. <laughs> But we should be able to get this in no time flat. We should be able to look at it and say, oh, that's x to negative 1 half. I should be able to execute the power rule on that and be able to spit out negative 1 half x to the negative 3 halves. 
and have exactly that derivative there. Okay, so we'll get there. So this is to help us appreciate that shortcut. We have to really sweat this thing out. It was pretty bad. Okay, all right. Um, we talked about being differentiable, uh, this limit existing. What does it mean for it not to exist? What does it mean for a function to not be differential? If you're looking at a graph, how can you tell? What is differentiability all about? And so um, if your graph has a corner, um, you might see it called a cusp in other places where your, your right-hand limit is headed to, you know, the, the limit of, not the function, the limit of your derivative. Like basically the slope, think of the slopes of the tangent lines. They are positive, and then very abruptly, they switch to being negative. So positive sloping tangent lines, and then all abruptly negative sloping tangent lines. That sharpness there, that's not differentiable. What we need is smoothness. Like differentiability is the smooth the function graph being smooth. This is not that at all. You're not differentiable if you have a corner. If you aren't continuous, you're not differentiable. Okay, continuity is a, is a must in order to be able to be differentiable. Okay, and so if your limit from the left does not equal your limit from the right, my tangent line slope is headed towards um, my tangent line slope is headed towards some value. My other tangent line slope might be headed towards that same value, but but it's the function is broken there. It's not continuous. For continuity, you need to have the left hand limit equal the right hand limit and equal to the function value and so that's just not the case and so uh when you're when you're not continuous then you're not differentiable okay and then finally um in this case here we have these positive sloping tangent lines and we have a zero sloping tangent line then we have these negative and then at, at that particular point x equals a that blue line is the tangent line slope it's a vertical line and so at that particular point, the, like the rise over the run, there is no run. The run is zero. The derivative is undefined there. Your, your function is, is not differentiable there. Those are the hardest to find, those kinds of points. But yeah, these are three different ways that a function can be not differentiable. You know, looking at the graph, how you can see that the function is not differentiable. Okay. All right, great. Uh, finally, then, we want to look at the graph of a function versus the graph of its derivative. And make the connections there. Uh, we'll get more formal with this later, but um, we need to be able to know how is it tied together. So here in blue are a bunch of functions, in red are a bunch of derivatives, and there's a matching question here. I have to match the function to the derivative. Okay. All we know right now is that the slopes of the tangent lines equal to the value for the derivative. That's all we know. So if I have negative sloping tangent lines and my function is decreasing, then my tangent line slopes are negative. The, the value of the function is negative. If I'm looking at the graph, I can tell it's negative by the fact that it's below the x-axis. So the sine of the slope is the tangent line. If you're positive sloping function, then your derivative graph should be above the x-axis. If you're a negative sloping tangent line, then your derivative of the, um, the graph of the derivative should be a graph that is below the x-axis. If you have a zero sloping tangent line, then the graph of the derivative needs to come into contact, maybe not go through the x-axis, but needs to come into contact with the x-axis. And that's what we'll use. That's all we know. That's what we're going to use here. We'll know more later, but that's what we know right now. So this graph A, it's decreasing, then it has a zero sloping tangent line. Then it's increasing, and it has a zero sloping tangent line. And then it's decreasing again. So it's negative sloping tangent line, zero. Positive sloping tangent line, zero. Negative sloping tangent line. What kind of graph below does that? What kind of graph is below the x-axis, then it hits the x-axis, then it's above the x-axis, then it hits the x-axis, then it's below the x-axis? It's got to be number two. Okay? Only one that does it. All right, then we move to the letter B. These, uh, this function is a piecewise function. It's made up of linear parts. The slope of the tangent line for a line is th the slope of that line. It's a constant. Okay, so you have a constant positive slope. Then abruptly, you have a sharp point. Abruptly, you have a negative sloping tangent line. 
then abruptly you have a positive sloping tangent line on graph B. Okay, and so I need to have places where my derivative doesn't, at those sharp points, my derivative does not exist. Only one of these graphs have, um, below the derivative graphs, only one of these guys have a, a non-existent derivative, that's row number four. Uh, it's positive, then it jumps to negative, and then it jumps to positive again. That's definitely Roman numeral four. Okay, so we have C and D, and we have to pair that with one or three. What's the difference in these graphs? Well, C has a zero sloping tangent line once, while D has a zero sloping tangent line three different times. That's enough right there to distinguish them. The graph of the derivative of C should only come into contact or maybe go through the x-axis once, while the graph of the derivative of D should come into contact or maybe go through the x-axis three different times. So that's it. We don't have to go through these sign analysis. Definitely C goes with Roman numeral one and D goes with Roman numeral three. You did it. And we'll dig more into this. And there's, there's, there's definitely a, a deeper connection when we move to the higher order derivatives, like the second derivative. And we'll be able to actually, at some point, I give you a function. And just from the information from the derivative and the second derivative, you'll be able to have everything you need to sketch a graph of the function. Okay. And making this connection between the function and its derivative. Thank you for watching. My name is Nakaya Rimmer. I'm happy to help you through this. Um, please comment down below, uh, like, and subscribe. And uh, this ends the series introducing the derivative. In the next series, we want to look at how can we shortcut this process. We need formulas. We need the we need formulas that help us to short circuit this thing to get through it quickly and not have to go through so much work. So that's what the next series of videos are. And then from there, we'll enter into another series of videos where we look at okay, what about this function e to the x? What about sine x? What about cosine x? What about these other guys? And then finally, another series about. Um, what about composite function? What about a function inside of a function? How do we take the derivative there? So that's all to come. Thank you for watching, and uh, we'll see you in the next video.